start today with a story, okay? And the story goes like this. The water of life wanted to be known by humanity. So it bubbled up into a free-flowing natural artesian well. And people could come from far and wide and drink freely of this pure and divine water. And yet humankind, as we do, we couldn't just let it be. So someone came along and built a fence around this well and started charging admission to get into the well and claimed ownership of this property. And they soon began to enact laws about who could access the well and who could not. And they put locks on the fences and before long, this natural free-flowing well of the water of life became property of the elite and the powerful. And so the water, angry and offended, stopped flowing and bubbled up elsewhere. And at first, the people didn't even notice it was gone. They kept on selling access to this non-existent water. And yet there were some who became dissatisfied they wanted the real thing, and so they searched out and they found the new well. And yet soon enough, that new well became under control of the elite and the powerful, so that this life spring moved once again. And this, my friends, has been going on for all of history. That the water of life, a metaphor for, for spirit, for truth, that so often becomes co-opted by humankind. So when some of us think of church, I know when I think of church, I think of this razor's edge, this fine line between church being a place of healing and of community, a place where the water of life flows and is freely accessible. And it also can just as easily become an institution of power of control, of greed, where it becomes the property, the fenced-in property of the elite and the powerful. Yet the psychoanalyst and author Robert A. Johnson has a commentary on this story. He says, the wonder of the story is that the water is always flowing somewhere and is available to any intelligent person who has the courage to search out the living water in its current form. I would even trade out the word intelligent for the word dissatisfied. That for so many of us, we become dissatisfied with anything less than the real thing. And we must go on this journey to seek it out. And I'm thrilled that this is why we all come together in a space like this. How many of you know what an artesian well is? It is named after a region but more scientifically, an artesian well, artesian well is a well that has water that is accessible without man-made intervention, without pumping, because of just the way that the aquifer is positioned. And when I first moved to Seattle, Washington, my, my roommate at the time and I discovered that we had moved in near an artesian well. <coughs> And we would drive past this well day and night and find that there were always people there, people of all different types who were united by this desire and this commonality to access clean water. And nobody owned this artesian well. So one day, my roommate and I decide that we wanna go check out this well and we don't know a lot so we each just grab a one gallon jug, like of milk or something, and we just show up at this well, and we stand in line, and we quickly realize that everyone else who is a regular to this well shows up and backs a full truck bed of 30, 40 <laughs> gallons worth of containers, and then spends the next 10, 15 minutes filling their water at the well. And then finally it's our turn, and in about 30 seconds we fill our one gallon jug <laughs> and feel a little bit like chumps because we didn't get the, the thing. But I, I really keep this memory in mind because it, it just makes me think of spirituality, spiritual community, church, and how 
What if church at its best is an access point for living water? Yet, so many of us know this is not always the case. In fact, it's often rarely the case. Rob Bell says, churches and religious communities and organizations can claim to speak for God while at the same time actually being behind, not in support of, but lagging behind the movement of God that is continuing forward in the culture around them without their participation. Living water will flow with or without the involvement of religion or church. How many of you went to go see the Taylor Swift concert film this weekend? <laughs> You're joking. <laughs> That? Nobody? Just one? You're, you're kidding me. I'm in utter disbelief. I thought I knew, I thought I knew my demographics, but unfortunately not. Well, if you didn't know, Taylor Swift put out a concert film of her recent tour. And during this film, they show images and, and clips of the audience experiencing this. And you have people of all ages and all types with tears flowing down their face and having an out-of-body Holy Ghost experience. <laughs> but it just reminded me how, how there are transcendent, divine experiences waiting for us all over the place, and church certainly does not have the trademark on them. In fact, in our culture today, many are not even looking to church to provide that. In fact, many who go to church aren't looking to church to provide that. Now, I want to be clear, I'm not against the structure, the organization. See, the artesian well that I talked about, there was a structure, it was paved, okay? There was a parking lot. It was not just a hole in the ground in the middle of the forest. There was some help and accessibility to get that clean water. And I think about the role of a spiritual community to be a place that is helpful to make water accessible for people. But I think when it comes to church and this razor's edge, I think if we're not helping, then we're hurting. Because if we're not pointing people to live in water, then we're pointing people to the building. And I think that that hurts. And when many of us think of that word church, we think of the fences, right? And the locks and the laws. And this is why for us, it's intentional to use the words of spiritual community as opposed to church, because when I say the word church, many of you, myself included, think of the place that we were hurt or the place that we were excluded. Today, if you're new, you might even be wondering, am I even in the right place? I thought I was at a place that wasn't exactly a church, and yet you're talking quite a lot about church today. I have a younger brother who just started high school, and he was accidentally placed in the wrong class, and he speaks English as a first language, but he was accidentally placed in an English class for English as a second language. But he didn't realize this for three weeks. <laughs> which says, Oh, which says a lot more about my brother than it does about the school. Yeah. I love you, Marshall, but had to do it. <laughs> but for the rest of you, you are in the right place. You're in the right class, okay? Yeah. <laughs> See, the reason why we're talking about church is that we have been in this series, Re, in which we are re-examining some words, some concepts that maybe have held some baggage for us, and we're hoping to reclaim some of these ideas. Instead of throwing the baby out with the bathwater, as, as we talked about last week, it's going into the bathwater and rescuing the baby. As we talked about last week in the context of reconstructing religion. And today, we are going to be asking the question, what would it look like to redesign church? Now, when we're talking about a redesign, we are not just talking about the physical architectural elements. We're talking about much, much more. However, I do think in some ways it's important that church redesigns some of the physical aspects, as you'll see here in this next clip. <laughs> Thank 
Father, thank you. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Oh, God, because joy has come. undertake this effort to redesign, I feel encouraged because humans, we love to redesign things. And I'm glad that some things have been redesigned. For example, at one point in history, the pinnacle of hygiene was a leaf, and we've luckily redesigned into this. <laughs> For those of you who have pets, we redesigned this into this somehow. <laughs> How about getting around? Back in the caveman times, there was only one way to get around, which was, of course, as we know, the Flintstone mobile. Some of you had this at one point. Um, but of course, we redesigned into this, which then got redesigned into this, and now doesn't exist anymore, unfortunately. Or lastly, staying in touch used to look a lot like this. A lot of ink, right? And then we redesigned into this. So we've done a lot of redesigning throughout history. And when it comes to the design of a thing, what we're really looking at is who is it for and how are they meant to interact with it? How many of you have been to Biosphere 2? If you haven't, it's one of the amazing things about living in southern Arizona. This is a science experiment that was meant to test whether humanity could exist in some sort of manufactured biodome environment meant to replicate conditions on Earth. And so it was designed with eight people in mind. And these people were meant to go in there and survive for two years. And in fact, they were, they attempted to give them everything they needed as far as creating a Earth-like environment all the way to creating an ocean, an entire ocean biome in Biosphere 2. So it was designed with these eight people in mind. And yet, how many of you know whether or not the Biosphere 2 experiment was a success or a failure? It was not a success. They did not make it the full two years. And in my recent first visit to Biosphere 2, I think I discovered the design flaw of why it didn't make it two years. See, in Biosphere 2, they attempted to bring in everything that they would need, and yet they did not think critically about bringing the correct coffee plant in the sense that they could only have coffee every two weeks. How many of you know that that's not a humane, livable situation? Of course, of course that was the flaw that ended the experience. No, there was a number of other things, but that's the one that stuck out to me. See, when we come across flaws, we must think about a redesign, and yet for Biosphere, they could not redesign in the middle of the experiment. That was the whole point. But for us, we can always think about redesigning things. We can always consider how we might update for new people, a new world, new concerns. See, the old design, built for a different time and different set of concerns, probably worked well or maybe worked well at a given place and a given time but there is a need to redesign. Before we can do that, we must ask ourselves, what is the current design of church? And as many of you maybe know, I invited you to come today with your ideas about what the new design can be, but in order to do that, I wanna ask you, what is, what is the current design of church? Does anyone have any, any thoughts on what, how do we structure church? I can get us started, and you get to be witnesses to my lovely handwriting. But the current design, for example, we meet at a specific day, 
and time. What else? Location. Location. Music. Music. A set of beliefs. Okay. Formal structure. Formal structure. Thank you. Oh, please. I say rituals. Ritual. Take a look for a second. This is crowdsourced, which I love. This is your thoughts, your experiences. And as we as we examined last week, not all of these are things that we need to change, or maybe we change in some way, but we hold on to some <coughs> aspects. But for how many of us, when we look at these different aspects, of what church is and how it's designed, how many of us would say that explicitly or implicitly these, these different aspects taught us some things about how we might view life, spirituality, God? I'll give you an example. God, for many of us, has been relegated to a building and a time and a place. God is in the building, right? Yet for indigenous people who walked this earth for tens of thousands of years experiencing God in all things, in nature, the idea of God being confined to a building is absurd. The Lakota medicine man, Black Elk, said this, the first piece, which is the most important, is that which comes within the souls of people when they realize their relationship, their oneness with the universe and all of its powers. And when they realize that the center of the universe dwells the great spirit and that its center is really everywhere. It is within each of us. This sentiment is echoed in the Hebrew tradition, in the Old Testament, Jeremiah 23, 23, I am a God who is everywhere and not in one place only. This carried through to the early Christian church in Acts. The Most High does not live in houses made by human hands. So how have we gone so far? How have we strayed? What does this word actually mean? If we look at the etymology of the word church, there are two words that there's some debate and divisiveness over where we actually get this word. The first is kuriake, which is a Greek word that means the Lord's house. And yet we see that even within early forms of these spiritual traditions, there is a challenge to this idea that the Lord, Spirit, the divine reality, the creator source, could be confined to a house. It's challenged by its own tradition, which we might think of as a paradox, or we might even go further and say, what is this other word, kirke, which is Latin, which means circle. Now the circle the sacred circle, the sharing circle, the community circle. This is an ancient and indigenous way that people gathered spiritually. If you were, if you were with us earlier this year when we had our conversation about what it means to be at the table, you might remember that we talked about how the table and the power of the table, meaning anytime you gather with those who you love for a meal to break bread, that anytime you gather at the table, you are 
actually engaging in a circle of sorts. And the power of the circle is that we see each other. We are all looking at one another. We are all vulnerable. We are all equals within the circle. And yet, when we think of this other definition of the Lord's house, for so many of us, it, it's one of power, one of separation, one where there are those in charge and those not in charge, right? One where God is in this place and he is not in another. So for today, may we make a delineation between capital C church, which we might think of as the building, as the schedule, as all of these things. And, and yet, lowercase c church, what if we thought of it today as, as the circle, as the place where we see each other, as the place where we are vulnerable with one another, as the place where we are equals facing one another. Now, to redesign, friends, is to be willing to let go of the current design of the accepted way. And yet, many times when we redesign, we also look back and we return to something maybe more ancient. I love, there's this term, ancient future. And it points us toward this idea that in order to move forward in a healthy and meaningful way, many times we need to look back. We need to go back to go forward. That maybe in our future, there is a return to some ancient Practices. So with that in mind, what are some new designs that we can give to church? Maybe looking at some of the old, how can we challenge, how can we grow, how can we modify? But it's everywhere. Church is everywhere and within us and within and all the time all the time we'd be in nature more nature meditation meditation being still not just the doing of all these things but in the not doing as well Totally inclusive, not confined to a particular tradition or a particular set of beliefs. An open circle. Sorry. Interactive. Interactive. There's I miss no... a closing song. <laughs> <laughs> She's like, let's go back a little. Let's still figure out some of the structure. We'll closing song. I think ritual is important to us. It's Mm. Um, if we can make our ritual not be offense. That's right. And and the circle, even <laughs> in its most inclusive and open and unfenced, is that not a ritual of sorts to gather? It's community. Community. see my specialty, which is how to fit things on a page when there's no more room. Shared responsibility, that's beautiful. How about enlightening? Enlightening. Filled with light. I like this idea because we often turn to this for what we can get or what box we can check and we come to this for how we can participate how we can give of ourselves i think beliefs are not a bad thing 
as long as they, like other things, are open mm. and inclusive. Because, I mean, if Aldea says, you know, love, we, love is our religion or love is our heart, that's a belief. Mm -hmm. I know. For those who are listening on YouTube or the podcast, I'll repeat that beautiful sentiment just in case it is not picked up by my my beliefs are necessary. They're beautiful. They connect if they are open, if they are inclusive, because even our community, under the belief of love, period, that is a belief. That is something that we share, a common value. And so these things remain important. And music. <laughs> no, I, the music. I, think, I think I think there just are more ways than traditional music, like what sounds and more music. didgeridoo. Yes. <laughs> Drumming. Yeah. Drum circle. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> just sounds. Sound. Mm. And the new design. Right. When I put an asterisk, it means it's. It's kind of going for both. I have my own system, everybody. You all, yeah. Don't worry. I'm going to take all this, clean it all up, and put it on social media and in the email so we can access this. Um, if you can't see it, which is unlikely that you would be able to, given my own penmanship, um, I will make this available for all. And of course, this will be articulated on our um, YouTube and podcast. And of course, if you have anything else you want to add, there will be a form to do that on social media. So I really appreciate all of these um, ideas. And I think in so many ways, this is our heart as a community to continue to participate in this ongoing opening of what it means to be a spiritual community, of what it even can mean to be a church. And I just sense the movement from the current to the new is about an openness and about seeing the divine in all places as opposed to just one. I want to switch gears as we close today. And I just, as we've looked at what it might mean to design and arrange a community, I also want to just for a moment ask ourselves what it looks like to design and arrange our lives. I would ask you today, what is, what is the shape of your life, the texture of your life? How have you participated in the designing and redesigning of your life? And is that design working for you? Is it actually supporting you to achieve the goals that you have for your life? I'll give you an example. You may look at the design and the arrangement of your life, and you might notice that at the center is career, that work is at the center. And I would just ask you, is that design working for you? You may zoom out, look at the design and the arrangement of your life, and you may find that you give to others and yet you've forgotten to receive. You've forgotten to actually create some space to give back to yourself. Maybe you zoom out and you look at the arrangement and the organization and design of your life and you just see some design flaws that aren't actually supporting you. Maybe they supported you at one time but they no longer support you. Like a spiritual community, the little things, they matter and they add up. The details are actually hugely important. Richard Rohr says it this way, although he probably was drawing from someone who said this before, how you do anything is how you do everything. So when it comes to redesigning our lives, friends, how you do anything is how you do everything. What's the first thing you do when you wake up? I'm guilty of often turning to a device, checking my email, checking my calendar. But, but what would it look like if we were to spend some time in, in gratitude and in meditation? Where do you take your meals? Looking at someone in the eyes or in front of the television? What role does media, does 
the cell phone and television play in our lives? Are we creating time in our weeks for self-reflection, for spiritual practices, for maybe a new definition of church? I ask these questions because I believe that everything should be at least up for a redesign. Everything should be eligible for a redesign in pursuit of something more whole and more authentic. And next week, we will even be willing to look at a reimagining of our ideas around God and ultimate reality. But for today, friends, let me encourage you in this. Would we follow the living water wherever it bubbles up? Would we be willing to let go of some old designs in order to create something new and life-giving? And would we be unafraid to redesign our own lives as we pursue our most authentic and whole selves?